people complain that I'm crossing too many boundaries. I write a novel which deals with physics and sex, or a historical novel which is set partly in the past and partly in the future, or I write a book that looks like a ghost story and turns out to be a detective story, or I keep mixing uh, the forms. Nobody knows in one of my books whether they're reading a thriller or a comedy or a philosophical treatise. I do that deliberately because I feel life doesn't have boundaries. You don't know from one day to the next whether you're living in a soap opera or an occult thriller or a science fiction novel or a detective story. just doesn't seem right. You should do a little checking before you drive out there, because once you're there, they've got you. How bad could it be? Excuse me, uh, I think I'm lost. Is this the Wattberg Research Lab or Club Fed? Your name, please. This doesn't much look like it does on the brochure, does it? All you Hirsch fellas say the same thing. I need some ID. Go to lot 92B, then get processed and personnel. I'm just here for the tour. I probably won't stay too long. Yeah, they all say that. Thank you. People are like the walking dead. I solemnly swear to morally commit my abilities to the common defense of America against all enemies, foreign or domestic. This is supposed to be the world's most advanced lab. How come you don't have thermographic printing? They don't spend it here in personnel. Index? Yo. I was a black hole. I'm shortcutting with two new programs. In one night? It's cool. If I have to sit through another readout, I'll go crazy. Oh, right. Uh, Kaplan's got another super crunch meeting tomorrow. You should sit in. Still not interested, Bob. Now, you gotta get your hands dirty sometime. Not if I keep them out of the mud. If you don't play in the mud, we kick you out of the sandbox. Oh, yeah? Excuse me. He's paranoid. I mean, Klaus is gonna blow up the world. <laughs> I think we gotta kick him out. You're just jealous, Kevin. Of what? You remember our last brainstorm. Yes, I do. Your theory was half-baked. Bob's was incomprehensible, and Ted's was outlandish. Mine was the only one in the realm of the senses. Oh, yeah? Shows how much you know, Pinhead. I overheard Klaus crowing about Ted's theory. Way to go, Ted. Look, I just came down to get a candy bar. You gotta be kidding me. They're gonna test Ted's theory with a nuclear detonation? A student theory? The old man must really love his ass. Oh, God. What are you doing? Laundry? No, I'm leaving. Boy, oh boy, you have no faith in me. I told you, I, I, I talked them rings around them during my interview. And look at the fellowship I hooked. They were smacking their lips to get me. Yeah, now they're chewing you up. <laughs> no, they're not, Jane. I'm on top of it. I got them thinking that they're using me, but... Say, I'm using them. I just toss them a few bones, and then I walk back to my terminal. You're collaborating with them already. No. It's nothing substantial. I'm just humoring them. <clears throat> it's P. 
Pure research. You know who runs your little lab. It's the same crooks who sell the bombs to the Pentagon. That's who you're working for. I'm working for myself. Well, at least now you're being honest. Before, you were working for mankind. And they'll be the last to benefit from this. Come on, Jane. You know Star Wars is just a fantasy. But I can't do my medical research anywhere else. You know that. I can't stop now. Let me see if I've got this straight. You help them blow up the world, and in return, they'll let you invent some new Band-Aids. That's a fair trade-off. <laughs> you have such a simplistic view of the world, you know that? You don't know how things work. At least I know what side of the fence I'm on. Where'd you put my car keys? We had this place to ourselves the whole weekend. Why do you want to leave? Jane, you're just going out to get milk, right? Just trying to make me feel guilty. You're coming back, right? What are you doing? Sometimes you have to join him to beat him. the border is when I gave up the Catholic Church and became a, an atheist. I was about 14 at the time and it was cataclysmic. Uh, I found I couldn't stand it out there in the vast ab abyss of uncertainty. So I crossed another border and became a Trotskyist. And then I had a new church, a new hierarchy, a new infallible authority, the Central Committee instead of the Pope, but it was the same thing and it was comfortable for about a year. And then I decided being a Trotskyist wasn't all that much fun, and really the Pope was funnier than Trotsky, and I might as well have stayed a Catholic. So I crossed another border and became an agnostic. I've been crossing borders ever since. At the moment, I think there are two countries uh, from which I am banned. Uh, one is Czechoslovakia, and the reason there is uh, that I did get in in 1968, uh, and I did expose the invasion uh, that had happened, or the conditions of the invasion. Uh, the other is the, uh, is the Soviet Union. Uh, and there, I believe, for two reasons. A, there was the, the Czechoslovakian entry, which I've already referred to. And also, uh, the first non-fiction book that I did uh, was about the KGB, and was called the KGB. And for it, I was denounced um, both in Izvestia, or on Izvestia, and uh, in Pravda. Uh, whether that banning still holds in the uh, era of Glasnost uh, and Petrochka, I, I, I don't know. It's uh, something I'm, I'm very much tempted to put to the test and see if I could, uh, could get in there. When I was in high school, I was so fascinated with nuclear physics that I decided to build an atom smasher. In my mom's garage, I built a 2.3 million electron volt, 6 kilowatt Betatron in the garage. It consumed so much power that every time I turned on my atom smasher, I would blow out every single circuit breaker in the house. When all the lights went out, my mom would just shake her head and say, why couldn't I have a son who plays baseball? We don't have bombs. Uh, we're not going to blow up anything. We're not terrorists. We deal in ideas. And the only reason uh, that can possibly be found for denying us entrance into this country is a fear that a fear of that one-to-one -one contact. We have uh, approximately 85,000 square miles of area responsibility. 
We do this with approximately 550 agents. This is the first hole in the fence there. You can see it, they cut along the, the pipe there and they just bend it back. They'll come right through there. I've had other people ask me, well, don't you repair these fences? They've been repaired before, but they're recut again. How many times, uh, how many holes are there along that? Oh, there's many holes. I don't think I saw a globe uh, until I was about uh, 10 years old or so. Before that, all I saw were flat Mercator projections where Greenland is bigger than Australia, and you've got all those distortions. When I first saw a globe, it was like a Satori experience. It was a great enlightenment for me to realize I was living on a ball. And uh, that, that experience has been vastly reinforced in the last six years in which I've been doing a lot of flying. The more I fly, the more I realize uh, I'm living on a great big ball uh, in outer space. Uh, spaceship Earth, as Bucky Fuller said. We're two-thirds of the way from the center of the galaxy. We're out in the boondocks. And we're floating out here all alone with, with no company at all. We haven't, uh, we're just beginning to learn to talk to the chimpanzees and gorillas, and we're working on learning to talk to the dolphins. But basically, we've got to figure it all out on our own in this, on this little speck of dust in a vast cosmos. Borders have been substantial in my life, uh, perhaps more substantial than I believe they should be. Uh, I would like to see a world without such borders. Absolute chaos. The system would fall down on, on, on many different levels. You would, of course, have free access for drugs, uh, free access for narcotics. It would effectively mean all tariffs were down. Um, so your, your economy would collapse. In the supposed rich countries like America, like England, you would be engulfed by third world people who imagined that if they came to New York or to Washington or to London or to Rome or to Paris, they literally would find the streets paved for gold. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the chaos would be absolute in a very, very, very short time. En unas veces le han agarrado la migra. Sí, sí, sí. pero me sueltan luego, luego. They, yes, they have, sí. but they automatically uh, release him. How many times? ¿Cómo veces? Pues ya me han agarrado muchas veces. Many. <laughs> muchas veces me han agarrado ya. En el... Gracias. Ya me voy. Ok. Sí. Que le vaya bien. Sí, gracias. Uh, borders are basic mammalian uh, territorial imperatives. All mammals uh, want a territory and they claim it by making uh, excretions that make a topological outline. That's the territory they claim. Uh, that's why your dog pees on every tree when you take him for a walk. Uh, that's the way the dog is marking his territory. Uh, chimpanzees mark their territories with excretions, too. The difference between human beings or domesticated primates and uh, the other mammals is we mark our territories with ink excretions on paper, land titles, peace treaties, and so on. Every national border in the world marks a place where two gangs of domesticated primates fought until they were exhausted and then made a territorial mark. That's how national borders are created. We don't throw excretions at each other like the chimpanzees. We throw chemicals and bombs and so on, but it's basically the same mammalian process. The only intelligent way to discuss politics is on all fours. It is not, necess not, necess not possible to travel within the Soviet Union uh, across the borders of the various republics uh, unless you have an internal passport that is issued to you by a department of the KGB uh, which means that at all stations and all times they know where every single person is traveling to. Well a few months ago I visited China and I was able to walk along the Great Wall of China and they told me that this fabulously long wall was the Star Wars of ancient China. It was designed to keep the Mongol hordes out of China, and yet all the emperors essentially bankrupted the treasury, causing revolutions inside early China because it drained the treasury for several dynasties. Well, today we can see that vision of a great wall of China in outer space will indeed bankrupt the treasury, and it will not keep out the Mongols in case of a war 
So many of us physicists that have worked against the Star Wars program believes that first of all you can penetrate that Star Wars shield and second of all it gives the illusion that you can have first strike capability. That is, it gives the illusion that you can strike first from behind a bulletproof vest. In 1966 all of my children were under the age of six and uh, at that point my husband didn't have a steady job and I was led to believe that by becoming a Mexican citizen, as the wife of a Mexican citizen, uh, it would make it easier for me to work and, and support my family. And as I very much needed to do that, I, uh, I went along with that. Uh, I took out Mexican citizenship. Really, I don't think understanding to begin with that that would mean the relinquishment of my American citizenship. The McCarran-Walter Act is the legislation which governs immigration in this country at this point, and it's governed immigration in this country for the past 35 years. It's a law that was passed by Congress in the McCarthy era. The clause which has been used against me uh, in layman's terms has been called the ide ideological exclusion clause. I'm not being accused of having belonged to any um, a political organization. I have never belonged to any. I'm not being accused of having been mentally ill or having a contagious disease. I'm accused of having ideas that, in the words of McCarran Walter, advocate the international governmental and economic doctrines of world communism. That's the way the statute reads. The judge in El Paso, the immigration judge who denied my uh, residency or, or upheld the INS's decision to deny my residency, said that he had read 2,744 pages of my work, I believe, and he quotes two instances as exemplary of, quote, advocating the doctrines of world communism, unquote. One of the uh, passages has to do with uh, my disagreement with U.S. policy during the Vietnam War years. The other uh, quote was taken from my book on Cuban women, in which I say that Cuban women um, today are better off than they were under Batista. opens to infinity in all directions. Uh, as Blake said, you can see infinity in a grain of sand. And Nietzsche said there are abysses everywhere uh, once you start really looking. Uh, but uh, because of our mammalian habits of uh, breaking things down into uh, territories, uh, we all create our own reality tunnel. Instead of seeing the infinity all around us, if we're born in Dublin, Ireland, we see an Irish Catholic reality tunnel for our whole lives. If we're born in Moscow, we see a Marxist reality tunnel all our lives. If we're born in Iran, we see an Islamic fundamentalist reality tunnel. If we're born in Arkansas, we see a Christian fundamentalist reality tunnel. If we're born in England and graduate from Cambridge, we see a Cambridge agnostic reality tunnel. Getting outside reality tunnels and perceiving the non-variable, non-symbolic, infinite flux of which we are part is very, very difficult for domesticated primates. I think it's worth trying, however. Uh, the real world is much more exciting and wiggly and alive than all of our stereotyped little reality tunnels put together. The Chinese, as you know, are very patient people. Uh, they do not like to rush into things. And it was very difficult for me to explain to them why we needed a uh, long, complicated trade agreement. Their uh, draft of the trade agreement that we, they wanted to work from was two pages. I think ours was about 40 pages. And when I tried to explain to them that if we didn't have uh, an agreement uh, that covered these points, uh, that the Senate wouldn't ratify it. And their 
query, quite reasonable, was uh, ratified. Do you not represent your government? Yes, when I was in Czechoslovakia, uh, I had identified to me uh, where a concentration of Soviet uh, tanks, border patrols, and uh, security people were. And I tried to reach it um, in a cab. The cab driver refused to take me uh, right up to it. And uh, I tried to do the rest on foot and encountered uh, a man in a uniform um, without any insignia and um, tried to do my best pompous. Uh, I am British, I have a British passport, I'm allowed to go where I want. Um, and the man, I don't think, could speak English, but he was quite disinterested in me being pompous. Um, and didn't even bother to speak, just fired his gun into the side of the, um, of the hill uh, and uh, making it very clear that I should go, and I did. Most people, uh, because of this habit of putting borders in the categories and their thought and separating things into parts, where there's actually only a seamless unity, they regard the uh, mafia and the narcotics uh, police as opposites, but actually they're both parts of the same system. Every time the police bust a big heroin ring, that means the price of heroin goes up. And so the, the thing is a self-perpetuating system. You take out any part of it and it falls apart. Uh, the borders are necessary to keep the prices up. It dwarfs the, the profits of General Motors. It dwarfs the profits of, of British Petroleum. Even if drug traffickers pay their taxes, uh, it would still exceed by billions legitimate business. The profits are staggering, um, and they continue uh, to increase. No country effectively has got a handle or managed to get a handle on how to curb it, uh, how to control it, and certainly not how to eradicate it. Uh, drug abuse, will, uh, both in the taking and in the trafficking, will never, never ever be able to eradicate it. Uh, and getting back to the question of borders, because the borders are unpoliceable, uh, as far as cocaine is concerned. There is, and there cannot be, any effective um, border control in countries like Peru and Bolivia and Colombia um, because most of those border patrols are heavily involved in the traffic which they're supposed to be stopping. Human beings are so ingenuity they can they can think of them if we can think of it they can think of it as good or better. Or once in a while they'll stop weed in, in the tires Sometimes in a gas tank, they might have uh, everything full of uh, narcotics and just have uh, enough to get across. They're genius. The fact is that we got to break the habit from the, our people to use it. That's, that's, you know, like everything starts at home. There have been occasions when the CIA have allowed trafficking, condone trafficking, because uh, it served their immediate intelligence purpose to allow it to go on. This happened particularly um, during the, uh, the Vietnamese War uh, when they uh, allowed, they, they wanted the, the, the help of the Mio tribesmen. They allowed the Mios to ship um, their heroin uh, in CIA planes. They denied it, uh, but it actually happened. Uh, and to try and distance themselves, they actually gave um, one particular trafficker, a man called Vung Pao, uh, they gave his own little airline, they gave him three aircraft, um, so that they could, in, within the strict letter of the law, say, well, it is not the CIA airplane, it is, uh, you know, it, it is this man's airplane. The CIA knew five years, if not longer ago, um, of the drug involvement of Noriega, uh, in, in Panama. It's, it's a well, well documented in CIA records, uh, but again because uh, it, uh, it went along with the policy of the government and the, and the administration, uh, the government chose not to, uh, to intervene until quite recently. And then look what a mess they made of it. You've got to ask, as the ancient Romans asked, qui bono? Who's profiting from it? And the people who are profiting from it are going to keep these laws on the books as long as they can.
the, the Vatican is a, is, a, is a hugely rich organization. Uh, there was one particular uh, now discredited bank, uh, the Banco Ambrosiano, um, which was uh, run by a man who was found hanged beneath a bridge in London called Roberto Calvi. Um, a lot of um, drugs money was laundered, was washed um, by Calvi's bank. Um, and Kelby's bank was uh, guaranteed by um, the Vatican uh, and by an archbishop who, who remains an archbishop. Um, he is uh, supposed to be uh, incarcerated within the Vatican itself. Um, and if he, has, um, if he steps over the border into, um, into Rome, uh, then he would be arrested. Uh, I think that um, is rather cosmetic, I'm quite sure. His name is Archbishop Marchenkus. I feel quite sure that Manchenkos travels quite freely around Italy um, without being arrested. There was, a, as there is with all money laundering operations, an amazing labyrinthine chain uh, where bank accounts were opened um, from, from the Vatican to Milan, from Milan into Switzerland, from Switzerland into Panama. And in Panama, again, we had Noriega, and a lot of his money was washed by this banking system. Uh, and then back into some of the um, Caribbean offshore tax havens, and then back into Italy. They're the most paranoid border people I've ever encountered are the Texas Rangers. They check you out when you come in from Mexico, and it doesn't matter how old you are, how straight you're dressed, how simple-minded you look or anything, and they stare at you as if they know you've got dope somewhere in your car and we're going to find it. And it's really unnerving. Even if you don't have to open your car, you start feeling like you do. Uh, being stared at in that way by people going through all your personal belongings, it gives you a basic feeling that maybe I do have dope. Maybe somebody planted it on me before I left Mexico. Maybe they are going to bust me. They can, nobody can look that nasty if I'm not guilty of something. That's the, thing, the feeling that Kafka dealt with in the trial. If people treat you as guilty long enough, you start feeling, well, gee, I must be guilty of something. What did I do? We have to, from us. What kind of work you do, ma'am? I'm a secretary. And whose money is this? Mine. Just went to the bank, ma'am, or what? No. When did you get paid? Excuse me? When did you get paid? On Fridays. Two hundred and seventy, four hundred bucks. How much you get paid? What's your salary? 450 an hour. And you got $400, honey? Yeah. What's wrong with it? Nothing wrong. Just you have $400 and you got paid Friday. The government lawyers subpoenaed the entire body of my work one week before we went to, to, to trial. They came up with 2,744 pages, I guess, of my work. Some of it, interestingly, was translated from Spanish publications back into their English, saying things that I would never have said. Um, at one point, they were going to they were trying to prove that I was unworthy to be admitted into this country because I had published a magazine in the 60s in Mexico City in which anti-American cartoons had appeared. Not cartoons drawn by me, but published by me. They objected to the fact that in that same magazine there was an ad for a bookstore that sold Marxist books. Um, they were appalled at the fact that one of the uh, issues of that magazine was dedicated to Huey Newton. Uh, that was sort of the level of uh, their accusations. At one point, I remember the, uh, the prosecuting attorney asking me if I had ever written a poem praising free enterprise, as if somehow, if I had written a poem praising free enterprise, perhaps that would have made me worthy of residency. Um, 
I've wondered since then if there are any anthologies of poems praising free enterprise. Now, I got accepted to Harvard University on the basis of my science research. But look, my father's a gardener. I did not have the money to go to Harvard. I needed a scholarship. And here came the Hearst Engineering Scholarship, saying that, yes, we can give you a four-year scholarship to Harvard. After graduating from Harvard in four years, I interviewed with Edward Teller, and he made a big pitch for me to go to Livermore National Laboratory, where, of course, they make the atomic and the hydrogen bombs. But again, it didn't associate, it, I didn't associate the fact that there was a hidden agenda involved with the Hearst Engineering Scholarship. That that scholarship, the Hearst Engineering Scholarship, is called the Star Wars Scholarship. That many of these young, impressionable minds that were recruited from high schools, these oddballs who built atom smashers in their garage, right? There were a lot of us. And they were awarded the Hearst Engineering Scholarship, fell under the charisma of Edward Teller, and because we had no memory of the Cold War, no memory of the Teller-Oppenheimer case, no, no professional memory of the fact that Teller was, was essentially isolated from the mainstream of physics, we followed the man, and many of us went right into the Livermore National Laboratory, where the Hertz scholars perfected the Star Wars system. The whole educational system is based on creating borders. The arts department is in perpetual warfare against the science department. And the physicists are at war with the chemists as to who's going to get more funding. And they're, they're continually creating artificial separations in the universe so that their specialty can get more money. Right now, the physicists are winning because they serve mammalian imperatives better than, say, the art department does. Most of the physicists in the United States today are engaged in research on one central project, which is how to deliver more, deliver more and more explosive power over longer and longer distances in shorter and shorter times to kill more and more people. And this is what the United States government and the United States people apparently thinks is the most worthwhile project in the world. So the physicists get most of the money. And so they, they, they're very intent on keeping up the demarcation between physics and the lesser sciences, which don't kill as many people so fast, or the arts department, which doesn't kill anybody hardly. And uh, eventually they'll have enough money that they can deliver infinite explosive power over infinite distances to kill infinite numbers of human beings. And then we will have achieved the goal of the last 50 years or so of American political thinking. When one is denied a residency, you receive an official denial, which I received after a 17-month wait by the INS uh, director in El Paso, Texas. And it was an interesting denial. What he said, in effect, was there is nothing in McCarran Walter that should uh, make you ineligible for residency in this country. But I'm going to make you ineligible based on my discretion. Uh, McCarran Walter also has a discretionary clause so that even if you are not found ineligible through any of the various 34 <laughs> clauses, an INS official can say, um, you're ineligible anyway. <laughs> so what he said was, you're not ineligible, but in my discretion, I'm not going to let you in. So he gave me 28 days to leave the country. At that point, I could either leave or decide to fight it, which I did. If you decide to fight it, you then go to immigration court. What came out of that, those four days was additionally interesting because that judge decided that in his discretion, I should be allowed to stay in this country. He found that my family ties and my contributions to the community were such that if it was up to his discretion, he would allow me to stay. But he found me ineligible under McCarran-Walter. He was the one who said that my writings advocated the international governmental and economic doctrines of world communism. I think when INS uh, officials, middle-level INS officials, are allowed to be literary critics, um, it's a very dangerous time. I think that uh, this kind of legislation promotes fear in people. I think it promotes self-censorship, which I think is a very dangerous thing in a, in a country. Uh, I think it creates borders of the mind. The first time I had a real sense of crossing a border was when I saw King Kong, uh, which I found the most exciting movie uh, of my life up until that age. And when the movie ended with Carl Denham saying, it wasn't the airplanes, it was beauty killed the beast, I crossed the border. I suddenly realized 
Something had happened. This wasn't an ordinary movie. There were meanings there I couldn't understand. I suddenly discovered there was such a thing as allegory and parable and symbolism, things nobody had ever told me about. King Kong was my introduction to serious art. There is no way of actually escaping borders. Human beings should be able to, um, to question authority. Uh, when you cannot question authority, what you have is a dictatorship. Now, Duchamp created in 1917 or 16, around there, the Society of Independent Artists to test if this um, society was working accordingly to the plans that he had in mind. He submitted a urinal and signed it R. Mott. And they rejected this uh, work of art on the grounds that it was not art because the artist didn't make it. That gave me the idea of naming that vent that is in a very prominent place in the Museum of Modern Art, naming art. All the way up until now, it has been looked upon as a, um, just a vent, nothing else. Nobody, everybody ignores it. So according in the, to Duchamp, in the tradition of Duchamp, by me saying that this is art, now it becomes art. I'm going to change the idea of uh, of the public toward this particular object. This is to force the museum to acknowledge me as, a, as an independent artist, which is what Duchamp tried to do, you know, to help artists like me, an independent artist, to be part of the Museum of Art permanent collection and be recognized by them. The museum doesn't know about it because I wanted it to, to be like that. I just have said to my friends, meet me at the Museum of Modern Art in such and such time. Go see the rest, as I say in the invitation, and then meet the best. <laughs> Does the museum or no, we don't have it. Well, they know because they have stage uh, guards all over the place. I see. Oh, so I so they, are, they are watching me very, very, you know. Well, this is some ideas. But well, I'm not doing anything wrong, you know. No, no, no. Anything no. Wrong. inside Mexico, the state of Oaxaca, Mexico. I asked them uh, what they were doing so far north, and uh, they said it's uh, very hard to live down there at this time. They grow pineapple and, and uh, watermelon, but uh, there's nothing right now, so they need to, to look for something to live on. So you can see that uh, it's mostly econ economical reasons why people come visit the United States. Ahorita viene por ustedes. Ahí se pueden sentar ahí. Well, I have a unit coming over to, to pick them up, so they'll be processed and return back to Mexico. And most likely, uh, being that they were apprehended early in the day, they'll probably try again later. are constantly aware of the sensitivity when they are dealing with with a human element a person is coming from Mexico that wants to find a job 
compared to someone that's smuggling cocaine and wants to shoot you. So we're seeing quite a few automatic weapons along the, the border with narcotic smugglers. This has created a concern at the regional level as well as the central office level that we should perhaps have parity as well as our agents being armed with automatic weapons also. They don't tell you this on the media, but most of our nuclear weapons are aimed at third world countries that don't have air forces, that don't have atomic and hydrogen bombs, so that we can control limited nuclear war in a theater. Again, that is not strength, that is a fool's paradise. If you think that you can fight a nuclear war in Saudi Arabia or the Middle East and confine it to just the Middle East, yet that's where the bulk of these weapons are going, to control third world countries. On another occasion, I was covering a war in India when Bangladesh uh, was created and um, we wanted to cross uh, into Bangladesh as it now is and this is in a, a delta, an enormous delta and it's impossible unless you are a cartographer to know where the border is. It's uh, water, land, water, land, water, land and we were just going across in, in dugout canoes. We did cross in and um, it was a time when there was a military uh, dictatorship run by a man called Yahya Khan, and his soldiers were killing refugees. Uh, I got separated from the photographer I was with. Uh, we'd arranged for the car that had taken us uh, as far as we could go to stay in a certain place. He got, the photographer got there, back there first, and to reach this car, I had to cross a, a wadi, uh, where the buffalo uh, wallow, and I took all my clothes off and wrapped it in my shirt and put it on my head and began to wade through and encountered an obstruction uh, and I didn't know what it was un until I pushed it aside and in fact it was a dead body I was I was wading through a, uh, a border crossing ditch uh, in which the, 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 the soldiers had been throwing bodies uh, that, that frightened me as I became older I realized more and more that borders are fictions there universe appears to be a seamless unity. There doesn't seem to be any borders, uh, any real demarcations in the universe. Uh, we, we put borders in because we're mammals and we like to mark territories. But the universe itself functions holistically. You can make a, a territorial mark on a map and say this belongs to us and this belongs to the bad people over there. The people on the other side of the border are always considered the bad people. That's part of primate psychology. Uh, but that doesn't change the fact that it's still one planet and if, if we're polluting our air here it's going over the border to pollute those people too and if they're polluting the rivers over there the rivers are flowing across the border to us and we're getting polluted drinking water well at the present time most Americans don't realize that we have sent so much junk into outer space that accidental collisions with that junk may be a definite problem after all our computers calculate the trajectories of much of this junk. We catalog, for example, thousands of wrenches and, and bolts and nuts that are orbiting in outer space. However, at a certain point, we're bound to come in contact with the point that we're going to lose our ability to control locating all this junk in outer space. Now, you realize that our early warning system has perhaps several thousand accidental warnings every year. Every day, there are several accidental warnings. Most of them are th thunderstorms, that is, spurious atmospheric disturbances. Now, with a thousand laser hydrogen bombs in outer space, our peace shield, so-called peace shield, orbiting the Earth, a random collision with a glove or a wrench, too small to be seen by radar, can definitely trigger all sorts of chaos. The President of the United States has five minutes to decide if, when our Star Wars shield begins to vaporize under collisions with junk, whether or not that was a deliberate preemptive strike by the Soviets, or whether it was a junk that happened to impact on the X-ray laser. The modern education, G.K. Chesterton said, consists of studying more and more about less and less until we know nearly everything about absolutely nothing. And somebody who knows physics and doesn't understand politics is a barbarian. That's the kind of person who'll go to work for the government and build bombs without thinking about the moral implication of what they're doing. And somebody who only knows the history of art from the Impressionists uh, to uh, uh, abstract expressionism or pop art or something like that and has no, doesn't understand the second law of thermodynamics, they're barbarians too. They have no concept of the reality that's going on around them and outside them and of which they are part. At that point, I realized that my heart was not into bomb making. 
that the future of physics lie with the unified field theory. Today, we think that superstring theory is that theory of the universe. Well, we physicists believe that in the beginning, God created a 10-dimensional universe, which was unstable, like a soap bubble that vibrated. The soap bubble cracked in half into a six-dimensional universe, which began to collapse, and a four-dimensional universe, which began to expand into the Big Bang. Therefore, our Big Bang is nothing but a rather minor aftershock of a much more cataclysmic explosion, and that is the cracking of space and time itself into two pieces. One, a six-dimensional universe which collapsed, and the other, a four-dimensional universe which began to inflate. So the superstring theory answers the question that Einstein could not answer. Where did the Big Bang come from? We now think that it was an aftershock of the breaking of a ten-dimensional universe. Some people say, well, what can the superstring theory do for me? What it might do is save all of intelligent life in the universe. You see, our universe is as a middle-aged universe, and we think that perhaps it'll stop expanding and eventually begin to recollapse into a big crunch. At that big crunch, all intelligent life will die in a cosmic fire, which will then reignite into another Big Bang. This means that all civilizations, all the tears and the blood and the sweat of all civilizations that have risen from the mud will eventually die. Here's another hole right here. Nicely shaped. Because if you do challenge somebody's reality tunnel and you're successful and the reality tunnel starts collapsing, they don't enter your reality tunnel. They enter total chaos and they, and, uh, they have anxiety attacks. And they're likely to feel that you're a Satanist who is messing with their mind or you're an unscrupulous intelligence agent trying to brainwash them or they'll have some sort of paranoid fantasy like that and they're likely to attack you physically. Um, everybody who knows anything about psychotherapy or the Gary Jeff work realizes that. You've got to be very delicate with people's reality tunnels. If they come to you for therapy, you've got to change their reality tunnels very, very gradually without shocking them too much all at once. However, as our four-dimensional universe begins to collapse, perhaps the six-dimensional universe begins to inflate once again. And as the six-dimensional universe begins to inflate, we have now an escape hatch which may allow us to then escape into higher dimension so that we will not die when the universe dies. It may be literally the only way to escape the death of the universe, and that is to jump outside the universe temporarily in order to make it into the next bang. As long as there are rule makers, there are people who just for the hell of it will be looking for ways to break the rules. You can see that very clearly in computers. Uh, there's this vast underground culture of crackers, as they, they're called, who just for kicks, and very few of them are making any profit out of it, just for kicks, they find ways to break into allegedly secure systems. Captain Crunch, he found how to break into the uh, phone lines of the White House, the CIA, and the FBI, all of which were allegedly uh, surrounded by so many safeguards that nobody could get in. Well, Crunch got in just to prove it could be done. Well, I can teach the computer to listen for dial tone or a data tone or somebody picking up the phone. What have you learned from that for scanning? Uh, well, scanning finds, uh, well, this was how Remob was found, the remote observation was found by scanning. There is a silver box number that the phone company installs to tap people's lines. So what they do, they, uh, they set up a special private number that you call it up into, and this number will tap a line. And that's what I use the computer for, to find that number, to verify that the phone company does indeed have these numbers. People are not aware of the fact that these things exist. And uh, it's kind of a, a bummer to have your privacy invaded all the time by these people who can come in and just sit and monitor your own private calls just because they think either think you're ripping them off or they think you're involved in some illegal activity and they'll monitor anybody they'll monitor their own employees they'll monitor people who don't even work for the phone company they work regular jobs just because they think these people are you know who knows why what kind of fear is that uh what kind of an entity 
with the power of the United States government, is afraid of a middle-aged writer, a woman whose books sell perhaps three to 5,000 copies a piece. Uh, it's a question that I have a hard time answering. My idea of reality has changed every decade in my life because I've studied new subjects and because science keeps bringing in new data that changes our concept of reality. The, there's a large school of thought in all the sciences these days that say we need a new paradigm, a completely new definition of reality. I seem to be the lone dissenting voice crying in the wilderness saying the new paradigm will be as much a case of self-hypnosis as the old paradigm and let's not kid ourselves. Uh, I'm, I think uh, what we need is not a new paradigm but no paradigm at all. Instead of a new model of reality we should recognize the relativity of all models of reality and understand that no model is reality. The map is never the territory. The menu is not the meal. You can't eat the menu. Uh, you can't live on a map of New York. Uh, our, our mental concepts are not the universe. And uh, trying to form a new paradigm uh, may be necessary at this point in history scientifically, but the new paradigm will contain as many holes as the old paradigm. I think true scientific and philosophical sophistication is identical with mysticism in recognizing that no model will ever do and that we should use a variety of models at different times depending on where we are in space-time and who we're dealing with and what, what problems we're trying to solve. There is no one model that will solve all of our problems. Or if there is, I haven't found it yet. <laughs>